Good morning. Good morning. It is 9 a.m. on December 15th. It's Tuesday morning. And so we are here together today to um, dig into scripture, to carry on our study through Samuel. And so I'm going to just hang out for here, here for just a second and wait for some eyeballs. Other, other than my own eyeballs. Sometimes Facebook is funny and it takes forever for it to just pop up as a, as a notification like, hey, Acton Methodist is online now. Okay, I see eyeballs. Hey everybody, good morning. Tuesday, 9 a.m. and here we are going through Samuel. So let's pray. Father God, we your children are here. We're here to hear from you. We're here to be transformed by you, through your word. Make it so, in Jesus' name, amen. So if you remember back to, hey everybody, good morning. Um, if you remember back to last time we were together talking about 1 Samuel, we, we learned about David and Abigail. Do you remember that story? He was after her husband because he had been um, disrespected in his own mind, but Abigail stops him and says, maybe, maybe don't do that. And so it, it was a blessed story that immediately followed a lesson he had learned. So David had learned this lesson. His heart had been struck by God to not kill Saul. He was, he was right there in front of him. He was able to snip off a bit of his robe he could have, hey everybody, good morning. He could have killed him right then and there, but he did not because again, God struck his heart. Well then in the very next, um, in the very next chapter, we have where David had an opportunity to practice that lesson of grace that he had learned and, and he didn't quite make it there, but Abigail helped him along. And once again, David's heart was softened. So here in chapter 26, that's where we're going to be hanging out this morning. Hey, everybody. Good morning. I'm so glad y'all are here. Uh, we're going to be hanging out in chapter 26 today because it's, it's more of the same. And so you have to start questioning if this is a lesson that David is learning over and over and over, and we know that David is called a man after God's own heart, then maybe there's a lesson for us here as well. So what we have here is once again, Saul is after David, okay? And so it comes to be that David finds out where Saul is camping and he takes one of his men and they go. Now, when they get there, they find that they are able to walk right up to Saul. His men are asleep and this, we're gonna start in, in verse eight, okay? This is a conversation between David's man and himself. And again, they just walked right up to Saul. I mean, he's right there. He once again has, has the opportunity to kill him. And this is what happens. Abishai said to David, today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. If you remember back to the last time this happened, it was his men telling him that same thing. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to him, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him down. Either his time will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and the water jug. The spear was in the ground right by Saul's head. Get the spear and the water jug that are near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head and they left. No one saw or knew about it. They snuck in and they snuck out. Nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the hill some distance away. 
and there was a wide space between them. And he called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner, aren't you going to answer me, Abner? And Abner replied, who are you and who calls to the king? David said, you are a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard your Lord, the king? Someone came to destroy your Lord, the king. What you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men deserve to die because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? And Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? And David replied, Yes, it is, my lord, the king. And he added, Why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done and what wrong am I guilty of? It's a very similar conversation to the last one, if you, if you remember back. Now let my Lord the King listen to his servant's words. If the Lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, men have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. They have now driven me from my share in the Lord's inheritance and have said, go, serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The King of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not try and harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have erred greatly. Again, this is the second time we've heard Saul say just about these exact words in maybe two, three chapters. Here is the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I value your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. And then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You will do great things and surely triumph. And we know that he did. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. We know that just like last time, they had a similar encounter culminating in a similar conversation. This wasn't, this isn't the end of, of this particular struggle between Saul and David. Saul will eventually die alongside his son, Jonathan, that we learned about before. And David will eventually take the throne and he's uniting the kingdom. And then we have that story to journey through as well. But right now, we have David again. So Saul tried to kill him. David had an opportunity to eliminate the threat and he didn't do it. And it happened again. David had the opportunity to eliminate a very real threat in his life. And he chose mercy. He chose grace because he knew that Saul was one, whether he was acting it out or not, that the Lord had anointed. And it just, it's, it's so hard, brothers and sisters, to, to offer grace and mercy to those who are, or it feels like are, actively pursuing us, actively seeking us harm or actively trying to make us look bad. I, I don't know that anyone's chasing us into fields or caves, but it does feel sometimes like people don't have our best interest at heart that people are, are trying to, to come at us or come against us or they mean harm for us in some way. And how difficult is it to offer grace and mercy to people who have done those things to you? And yet that is what we are called to do. And so we're seeing this play out in 1 Samuel time and time again and I really do think that it's because it plays out time and time again in the human condition, in our world. And you know, that's, that's not just my opinion. If you have your Bible with you, and I hope that you do, turn to Matthew chapter 18. If you turn to Matthew chapter 18, we're going to begin 
in verse 15. If your brother, again, Matthew chapter 18, if your brother sins against you, go and show him your fault or his fault. So this is a, this is a, if there is a struggle, if there is something going on between you and a brother, this is what you do. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, but excuse me, if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if, if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, teach, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now go to 21. So this is Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times. Now, when we're thinking about Peter, Peter is, is like the disciple all-star, sort of. I mean, he wants to be anyway. He, he wants to, to get it right. And we know throughout Peter's story that he doesn't. He gets it wrong quite a few times, but he wants to get it right, and he wants to please Jesus, and he has this heart for Jesus. And so Jesus kind of slaps him down a little bit right here because what Peter's doing is saying, because culture would not have expected any forgiveness whatsoever. None. That was what culture, culture would have been the men of David saying, hey, you can take vengeance into your own hands, so go ahead and do it. That's what culture would say. But Jesus said, Peter, mm -mm. because he says, how many times, Jesus, seven times? And Jesus says, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying, to, you're trying to get there, Peter, but you're not quite getting there because he says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Not just the number of times that you think is extravagant, but take that and don't just double it, don't just triple it, but 10, 20, 100 times what you think is extravagant, that is the kind of heart I want from you, Peter. That is the kind of forgiveness. That is the kind of grace. That is the kind of mercy. And then if humanity is able to give that kind of grace and mercy, brothers and sisters, how much grace and mercy does God offer us every single day? Praise the Lord. It is not an easy walk we're on. Sometimes we... Sometimes we suffer the consequences of our own sin, and sometimes we suffer the consequences of other people's sin. And forgiveness is something that we are called to, even when it's hard, and even when we could end it right there. We recognize that God, if we are drawing breath, is not done with us. And if we recognize that about ourselves, then we have to recognize that about other people. If they are drawing breath, God still can move in them. Even the ones you think are completely hopeless. We don't have the power to write people off. So it's a hard thing to do. But I have to believe that if Jesus calls us to do it, that is absolutely blessed. And I don't believe that God calls us to anything that he won't equip us for. So we have been called and thus equipped to forgive. And the choice is ours as to what we do with that. So for me, it's a good word today. I hope it's a good word for you. I am wondering what's on your heart this morning. I would love to pray for you whatever is, is going on in your life or in the lives of your loved ones or, or maybe your community. And so you can put your prayer requests in the comments if you like, or you can um, go to actonmethodist.com slash prayer and our prayer team, our awesome prayer warriors, will absolutely be honored. It will be their joy to lift you up, to come alongside you in that way. So, 
Let's pray. God, we take a deep breath in and we let it out. And we remember that you are God and we are not. Lord, thank you for this second time that David had an opportunity to take vengeance into his own hands, to eliminate a threat and didn't do it because you had softened his heart. Thank you for the reminder that you soften ours as well. if we are open to your word, if we are open to your spirit, that you call us to forgive, not to a point that we think is extravagant, but to a point that you do. And you equip us to do it. God, remind us that forgiveness is not a feeling, but that it's a choice and a calling. It's an act of will And Father, for those who find it really hard to forgive, remind them that forgiveness, it's not forgetting, it's not leaving doors open for further abuse. It is freeing another person from some sort of debt that we feel they owe us so that we too are freed from bitterness. Father, it is a lesson that we have to learn every single day. So remind us every single day of just who you are and just who we are called to be as your children that we are to be beacons of light and joy and hope and peace, even in a world that says that that is weakness and that that is folly, that that's just silliness. That what other people think doesn't matter. Put it on our hearts that the only one that we need to consider is you when we are choosing to share the love of Jesus. Strengthen us, God, and encourage us because forgiveness is hard. Reconciliation is hard. Being that first agent of reconciliation is hard. Forgiving when someone doesn't even come to us for forgiveness is hard. God, it's hard. And you say, that in this world, it's gonna be hard, but that we should take heart because you've overcome it. So encourage us today, God, to remember that, to claim that same victory that you've already won, to live into it, God. Embolden us to speak it out into the world Sometimes being your disciple does not make sense to the world around us. I think that makes our job all the more important. May we go out as your people today and every day, sharing your love, sharing your story, sharing just who you are until no one thinks it's silly anymore because they have been struck by you too, deep in their heart. They have said yes to you too, forever and ever. They are yours too. The power of your Holy Spirit can do that, God. We know it. So we thank you that you move and that you breathe and that you transform. Even when we can't see it, you're doing it.
for the need for hope in the midst of a pandemic that seems it will never end. Awesome God, you have, you have the power and I believe you have the desire to raise your church up, raise your children up in such a courageous way that we go out into a world who is terrified and angry and frustrated by this pandemic, who are sad and heartbroken. You give us the ability, you awaken us to be able to go out and point to you the oh my goodness, the foundation of our faith, the source of our hope and our joy. God, help us. Strengthen our spirits so that when we see the lost, when we see the hopeless, when we see the wandering, when we see the broken, that we can speak what you have done and are doing inside of us into those children of yours who are hurting. God, flood those who need your peace now more than ever with comfort. You can do it, God. We know that you can. And more than that, we know that you will. And that you are. And that you have been. God, we pray for eyes to see you, ears to hear you, and hearts wide open to you. We surrender not just our day to you anew today, Father, but our lives. Do with us what you will. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, it is going to be a good day. It is very cold, but it's a day, right? And so every day we have the most awesome opportunity to go forth because Jesus is the vine and we are the branches to sprout some of that good Holy Spirit fruit. So let's do it. And I will see you, well, tonight for the Advent reading. If you've been following along our uh, lives, then we come to you every single night through Advent to read a different chapter from the Gospel of Luke. And so today, one of our pastors will jump online between 7 and 7.30 and we'll read Luke chapter 15. So I hope that you're here for that. But I will see you on Thursday. Bye.